2 Corinthians chapter 5 in the Word of God. It's a joy to be a part of this conference for the uh, RU ministry. I'm very grateful that God raised up uh, Reformers Unanimous. God has used it to bless many, to help many, to bring many to Jesus, not only in the matter of salvation, but in deliverance from the power of sin this side of heaven. I've said for years that one of the reasons why God blesses this ministry is that it is built on revival truth, truth that points people to Jesus, accessing His very life, which is the victorious life Himself. And I'm thrilled about the emphasis of this conference uh, on the matter of essentials because there are truths that are absolutely essential. And when it comes to this whole matter of a faith-based program. Uh, faith is based on the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And God's words are given to us as promises. Those are the will be's or the shall be's or they're given to us as facts. That's what's already there. And we're going to look at some facts for those who are true children of God, for those who are saved, some facts that can make a radical different, a difference. So in order to really exercise faith, you have to be convinced of the facts. So let's look at a a verse of scripture that's fascinating, fascinating. There's a phrase in here that we'll come to in a moment that is uh, perhaps puzzling, but oh, when the truth of it explodes, it can be life changing. So if you have your Bible, hope you have it opened uh, wherever you are. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse 17, the authoritative word of God says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What an amazing verse. There's a new creation. And because of that, there is the statement, all things are become new. What does that mean? The title of this message is All New Realities. Wherever you are, will you join me in prayer? Let's ask the Holy Spirit to open our understanding. Blessed Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give us a glimpse, a sight, uh, a revelation of the truth that is connected to these inspired words. And Lord, would you so open our understanding that in the illumination we become convinced of what is for every child of God, that we might respond in real faith and experience grace on a whole new level. I plead the blood of Jesus. Lord, protect from the attack of the enemy who would seek to hinder. I pray that you'd knock out his deceptions, knock out his lies. Undeceive us, Lord, where we need that. Lord Jesus, we claim our position in you at the throne far above the enemy. And in your name that is above all names, we exercise your authority over any powers of darkness that would seek to hinder and trust you that that not be allowed. Breathe on us now, Lord. Use truth to set people free. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Some years ago, I was teaching a course at the RU College, a course on sanctification. We were walking through the details of Romans 6, 7, and 8, which is uh, very similar in emphasis to what we're going to see in uh, much of the message today. And I remember as we were right in the heart of our provision, the provision that God has actually given and is giving to every one of His children. One of the ladies raised her hand. She had been through the program. She was growing in the Lord. She had a puzzled look on her face. And I called on her and she said, you mean we don't have to sin? And I said, well, ma'am, if words have meaning and if language has integrity, then the provision is such that, yes, actually it's that good. And she began to weep. Now, friends, what are we talking about? You know, in our world, we have things that we use and they get old and sometimes we uh, try to fix them, repair them. Uh, sometimes I use a little duct tape if that'll work. Uh, but eventually it's time to just get rid of it and you replace it with something new, but then it gets old again and we keep going through the process. But in our text, in this passage, there is a new that stays new. There is a new that is fresh and ready and always available when we need it. There are these all new realities. Look again at the verse. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ. Right now, anyone listening to this message is either in Christ or you're out of Christ. 
And if you have come to a point where you've understood sin is the problem, hell is the consequence, Christ alone is the answer, and you've made a choice to trust in him to save you from sin and hell, then at that moment, among many other salvation truths, the Holy Spirit placed you into Christ. You were immersed, baptized into Jesus. You're in him. That's a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous reality. Well, let's read on. When this is the case, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Literally, the word is creation. Uh, we will come back to that. It's a powerful, amazing expression. Then it says, old things are passed away. Now, the verb tense that's used there is the fact of an action. It's in the past. It's tied to the moment you believe and when you're placed into Christ. And so at that moment, old things have passed away. Then it says, behold, all things are become new. Here the verb tense switches slightly. It's still the fact of an action. It's still in the past. It's still tied to the moment you believe and uh, that moment when you're placed into Jesus. But this time the verb tense indicates that there are ongoing ramifications right into the future, right into the present. You see, there's our new that stays new. There's something that happened. And because of that, there's something that's all new. And it stays new. It's always fresh. It's always ready. So that when you need it, you can take it. And when you do, your experience is radically revolutionized by the power of the life of Jesus Christ. And God wants us to learn to take the new realities so that when we act, it's not just us. It's Christ in us animating our very personalities with his divine and victorious life. So, what's new? In the time we have, I want us to focus on three new realities. The first, the real you. When you got saved, you got a new you. And that new you is the real you. Now, friends, let the Spirit of God sink this into your heart because often we have a wrong idea about who we are. And that is why we don't live right because you act according to what you believe you are. And even if what you believe is not correct, you act according to what you believe. So let the Spirit of God convince you of who you really are in Christ so that your actions flow out of what you believe and what you believe be based on actual truth. The real you, we've seen here, Old things are passed away. Now, whatever that's talking about, both in the words, the meaning of the words, as well as the verb tense, whatever it is, it's done. Whatever it is, it's not partial. It is complete. The old is completely gone. So what does that mean? That kind of puzzles us, perhaps. And especially, here's the phrase that puzzled me for years, behold, all things are become new. Now, to me, it would have made more sense if it had said some things. Okay, I'm on my way to heaven now that I'm saved. But it doesn't say some things, it says all things. What does that mean? You know, when you read verses like this and phrases like this, you can't just let it go. You've got to stop and say, God, you've got to tell me. What does this mean? Open my understanding. What does it mean? All things are become new. Well, let's stop and chew on it. The human constitution is made up of body. Within our body is our soul. Within our soul is our spirit. Let's just kind of uh, pause on each one of these and see what's all new. Let's start with our body. Is your body all new? Usually there's a chuckle in the audience when I ask that question because there's people with aches and pains as they're listening to the very message. You know, the body is not all new. It's getting older every day. I remember when I was about to turn 40, uh, some of the uh, friends of mine that had already turned 40 were saying, John, I'm going to warn you, there's something about it. When you turn 40, your body starts going downhill, can't play sports like you could anymore. And uh, they said all this and, I, you know, it was not exciting. <laughs> and I wasn't really looking forward to that. So I had my birthday. Day, and by the end of the day, I thought, you know, I still feel pretty good. <laughs> and a few months later, I said, you know what? I still feel good. I don't know what those guys are talking about. Got to the end of the year. And I thought, you know, I still feel good. I don't know what those guys are talking about. 41, still felt good. 42, still felt good. 43, I started to slip. <laughs> and it's been going downhill ever since. Well, the day is coming, if you're a child of God, that these bodies will be glorified and mortality will put on immortality and what a day that will be. But that's future. And whatever this passage is talking about is past. 
So that means whatever this is talking about, it's not talking about your body because your body's not all new yet. It will be, but not yet. And whatever this is talking about is already all new. Well, let's go to our soul. Your soul is your mind, your affections, and your will, your chooser. Let's start with the mind. Do you ever think wrongly? Well, we all know the answer to that question. Sometimes we just don't think right. Sometimes it's impurely, sometimes it's just off course in a variety of different ways, and we buy into Satan's lies, we don't think right. Well, that's not all new. Well, let's go to your affections. Your affections where you allow what you understand to affect you. That's why sometimes we use the word emotions because they get stirred based on what we're thinking about. Let me ask you, do you ever get in a bad mood? I said that to one audience and everybody looked at a certain person. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's sometimes you're just in this dark mood. Well, that's not all new. Well, let's go to the will, your volition, your chooser. Friend, do you ever make wrong choices? Wow. You know, we all do at times. <laughs> there are times when I'm thinking, John, what are you doing? And we make wrong choices. So obviously that is not all new. So whatever our text is talking about, not only is it not talking about the body, it's not talking about the soul. Do you know that there's only one part of us left that this could be talking about, and that is your human spirit. Now let me pause on this because this is important. And by the way, I'm going to spend more time on the first point than the last two points, so when you see this one running long, uh, you'll understand. But uh, body, soul, and spirit, if you think about in concentric circles like a target, where there's the outer circle, the next circle in, and then the bullseye in the middle. That bullseye is that human spirit. And prior to salvation, that part of us uh, that uh, is unregenerated is called the old man. We know this because Romans 6 and verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is, literally was, has been crucified with him, with Jesus. Okay, so the old man got crucified. Well, what part of us got killed? Physical death is when the soul separates from the body. That has not happened if you're watching this uh, message. So that means it's not talking about your soul or your body. Well, there's only one part left then that it could be labeling, and that is your human spirit. So the inspired Word of God labels, personifies the core of your being. Uh, the real you prior to salvation is the old man. It's the unregenerated human spirit. Now, in order for that part of us to die with Christ, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, then that means that there has to be something that that old man, someone that that old man is joined to, because the practical essence of death is separation. Just as physical death, the soul separates from the body, okay, this old man, in order to be crucified, in order to die, it has to get separated from someone. That someone is indwelling sin. In other words, we are born, because of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, with a sin bent. There is something, there is someone, there's some kind of entity in us that leans us, leads us toward sinning. Now, I'm not talking about sins, as in actions, as in plural, as we find in Romans 1 through 5, but sin singular, as we find in Romans 6 through 8, 6 through 8, that in Romans 7, two times is called sin which or who dwells in us. That's why I say indwelling sin, and I say who because in Romans 6, 6, when it says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified him, with him, it's that the body of sin, the body is the turf for the activity of this entity called sin, this indwelling sin, that the body of sin might be rendered ineffective. That's that word destroyed, so that... We might not serve sin. See, the text then personifies this indwelling sin, this something, this someone in us that leads us towards sins. It's not sins. It's the reason why we sin. This, this master, you see, that we henceforth should not serve, serve sin. So there is this old master of indwelling sin. So again, in your mind's eye, here's body, here's soul, here's spirit. That's your old man, the unregenerated human spirit. 
spirit, but that old man is in a relationship. In other words, you could take the bullseye and then draw another circle about the same size, overlap the two. That other circle then would be over, you know, kind of overlapping in the soul and body, larger circles. That's the old master. Prior to salvation, we are chained. We are uh, in a relationship with this old master of indwelling sin. And that relationship taints everything that we do prior to salvation. Because everything we do is in union with that old master which defiles it all, shows that at best it's self-dependence, which can only produce self-righteousness, that God calls a filthy rag in Isaiah 64 that falls short of his glory in Romans 3, everything that we do as an unsaved person. And the only way out of this relationship, the only way out of this shackled union where we're chained as a slave to this old master of indwelling sin is for one of those partners to die. Now, friends, we can't do that on our own. But Jesus did it for us. Romans 6 and verse 10 says, When he by himself... He died, the scripture says, unto sin. He, for us, in our behalf, died unto sin. Now, that's different than the marvelous truth that Christ died for our sins. That's gospel truth, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Hallelujah. Christ died for our sins. We can be saved. We can uh, uh, be on our way to heaven. But this is Christ died unto sin. Now that means there had to be a time when Jesus came into union with our sin. Now, friends, this is what happened on the cross. Crucifixion day. You remember in the, old, uh, in the, in the Gospels, it uh, gives the account that from 12 noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the entire earth was darkened. What a day. Why? That's when Jesus, toward the end of those three hours, cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those are very strong words. Why did Jesus say that? Friends, it's because in those hours, Jesus, the Son of God, but functioning as the Son of Man to represent us, He was separated. That's the essence of death. He was separated from the Father because He was in union with us, and in particular with our sin. In fact, the sins of the entire race, from the first Adam and Eve who ever lived to the last human being who will ever live, the sins of the race went with Jesus, on Jesus, there at the cross. And that is why Jesus is called the last Adam. Friends, this is why he agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was not running from the cross. He came to sa save sinners. It was the way of the cross. It was that for the very first time, Jesus, the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God, was going to be separated from the Father and in an actual contact with the sins of the human race. No wonder there was agony. But you know on the cross, when He became sin for us, before He voluntarily gave up His spirit, He cried with a loud voice, It is finished! And then He died, Romans 6.10 unto sin once. Now back to our text. In verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ. You see, the moment you believe on Jesus as your Savior from sin and hell, among many other salvation truths, the Holy Spirit places you into Jesus. You're in Him. And do you know when you got placed into Jesus? You got placed into His history. And friends, that means not only do you get a new future, praise the Lord for that, but you get a new past. <laughs> Let it sink in. You see, when you got saved, the Spirit baptized you. He placed you. He immersed you into Jesus. You're in Him. And when you got placed into Jesus, you got placed into His history, which means you got placed into His death. There it is. And we're going to see his resurrection. But right now, you got placed into his death. You see, the truth of the matter is, our core, our unregenerated human spirit, that old man is shackled. It's in this, this awful relationship. We're chained to that old master of indwelling sin. We can't get away on our own. 
But friends, Jesus died unto sin. The essence of death is separation. And when you believe on Jesus, you're placed into Jesus. Therefore, you're placed into his history. Therefore, you are placed into his death. And that means at that moment, in the immaterial part of your being, where your old man is chained to this old master, the cross comes in, as it were, like a mighty knife and cuts right through all of those shackles, cuts right through all of those chains and sets you free. That's why the next verse in Romans 6 says, For he who has died has been freed, liberated from sin. The old master, that's what it means to be dead to sin. I used to wonder what that meant. And uh, I pondered it because I didn't feel dead to sin. But friends, you were placed into Jesus. You're placed into his death. And therefore... He died unto sin for you. The cross comes in and you are separated. You're severed. You're freed. You're liberated from that old master of indwelling sin. Now, the old master still hangs around in your soul and body level. That's why they're not all new. But your core, the real you got severed from that old master. And not only did you die with Christ, here's the good news, you as well, you were raised with Christ, the new man. That's what our text is talking about as we read on. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I said we'd come back to this. Here it is. A new creation. It's a word that involves a creative act of God. Now, friends, something powerful happened when you got saved. There's something that powerful, powerful happened that right inside your being. In other words, in the immaterial part of you, that old man, the unregenerated human spirit, dies with Christ. You're severed from the old master. You're set free. But you're raised with Christ, the new man, this new creation. And according to Ephesians 4.24, the new man is created, now get this, after God in righteousness and true holiness. What does it mean after God? Well, 1 John 3, 9 explains that that part of you is God's seed. Literally, God's sperma. Something of God's nature was implanted into you when you were born again. That is astounding. See, that's the new man that is created, new creation after God, God's seed, God's nature implanted into you in righteousness and true holiness. Look, that part of you is God's nature. See, Jesus is the last Adam as he took all our sin to the cross, but he's called the second man because he begins a new race because when you believe in him, his nature is inserted. It's implanted into you. There has to be a part of you made holy so that the Holy Spirit can move in. And we're going to see that here in a few moments. But there's a part of you that's actually made righteous. Now, friends, it's not just that you're declared righteous. That's a marvelous truth. That's justification. When you get saved, you're declared righteous, even though your soul and body haven't caught up yet. But there's a part of you that's made righteous. That's regeneration. In fact, if you look down to verse 21, if you have your Bible open there to 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us. Okay, that's what we've just described with Jesus coming into union with our sin on the cross. And let me tell you, friends, that was not just theoretical. That was not just positional. That was actual. He, we're told here, God the Father hath made him to be sin. You see, he came into union with your sin and mine. That was actual. So let's read on. That we might be, what's that next word? Made made the righteousness of God in him. It's a word that means become made the righteousness of God in him. It's not just that you're declared righteous. That's true. But there's a part of you that's actually made righteous. This is more than a new position. This is a new provision. There's God's nature provided. It's brought into you. It's implanted into you. That's the real you. At your core, you are righteous if you're a child of God. Now, I'm going to tell you, friends, that's why God calls you a saint. 63 times in our New Testament, God calls us saints. Amazing. Even when we're not acting saintly. Now, I'm going to tell you, friends, if you're saved, you are a saint. You were a sinner. You are a saint. So let's stop calling ourselves sinners. 
I recognize we're saints who can still sin. Don't misunderstand me. But at your core, there's a radical transformation that's already taken place. There's a part of you that's all new. Thus, you were a sinner. Now you are a saint. And the sooner you believe that, your actions now can be affected because you act according to what you believe you are. And if you're still believing in your belief system that you're this dirt ball sinner, then that's what you're going to act. But when you allow the Spirit of God to convince you, no, 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 there's a radical change. Stop insulting the salvation that God provides. That, friends, when you get saved, there's a part of you that's made righteous. It's God's nature implanted in you. Look, that nature is righteous. That nature is holy. That nature is loving. That nature is good. And that nature got put in you when you got saved, and it's been there ever since. Even on your worst day. <laughs> when it was totally ignored. But it's there. That's provision. So when the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, that's talking about your soul. On the soul level, we can get deceived. We all know that. But on the spirit level, you are not desperately wicked. You're radically righteous. That is a sinless provision. Now, don't misunderstand what I just said. I didn't say sinless perfection. I said a sinless provision. Obviously, God's nature is sinless. And that part of you <laughs> is what connects you to God in that spiritual realm. Now, obviously, we don't always access that provision. We could. We don't always do it. When we don't, we are caving into a lie caving into the old master who still hangs around, tries to deceive us, tries to make us think that we're him and he's us, but he's not us and we're not him. But when we yield to the flesh where that old master operates, uh, when we cave into the flesh, then the works of the flesh are manifested, Galatians chapter 5. And did you know that unsaved flesh and saved flesh looks exactly alike? Adultery looks like adultery. Envy looks like envy. Flesh looks like flesh, saved or lost. And so when we pander to our flesh and yield to that master who's no longer our master, then we look like what we're not. Because, friends, at your core, you're righteous. And that's how God the Father views you. You're his child because his seed is in you. You're righteous. And friends, the sooner we understand that, what a difference it will make. Not a reason to go out and sin, but a reason to move on to victory. Now, in light of that, let me just pause a little bit longer before we get to that second point. To contrast Satan's lies about you versus God's truth about you. See, Satan lies to us, and so many of us say, well, I'm a loser. I'm just a dud, man, look how I failed. Oh, other people seem to get this victory, you know, this victorious life thing, but me, you know, I, I just must be a dud. Uh, you know, maybe I'm just a rebel. In fact, sometimes parents, sometimes uh, Christian leaders unwittingly side with the devil against an individual by saying, ah, oh, you're just a rebel, you're going to learn the hard way. Well, they probably will now. But the truth is, if you're saved, you're not a loser. Now, don't get me wrong. All of us can make wrong choices, and in that sense, we can rebel. We can disobey. But what I'm simply saying is, at your core, the real you, you are not a rebel. You are not a loser. You are not a failure. You are a winner because Christ won for you and placed his nature in you. That's who you are. You see, another lie is to get us to think that we are forever defined by the shame and the guilt that we feel from that worst day. And Satan plays off of this. And, uh, you know, this is your identity. No, that's a lie. That worst day, maybe something you did. Maybe something that was done to you. And in our world of sexual abuse, this is massive. And Satan plays off it. And he tries to get you to think that you're forever defined. This is your identity. By the shame and the guilt that you feel from that worst day. All of that's a lie. Because from God's perspective, God who is your heavenly father, you are defined by God's view of who you are in Christ. 
righteous. That's your identity. You're in Him. You're accepted. And we need to grab a hold of that, to take it by faith. Here's another lie. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. <laughs> well, wait a second. Let me explain what I mean by that. We were sinners saved by grace. That's truth. But friend, if you're saved, you need to stop saying, I am. Now you can just change the wording. I was a sinner and I'm saved by grace. That's accurate. But when we say I am a sinner, that's a wait a second. God says you're a saint. Why are we contradicting God? You see, it's a subtle way to get us to think wrong and whatever you believe down deep in your, your heart. In other words, not just the thoughts up here, but what you latch on that becomes your belief system. If you think, well, I'm just a dirty, rotten sinner, then you're going to act according to what you believe. When the reality is you're a saint, who can still sin? We all know, th know that. And in that sense, we could say, I am a sinner, but, but at our core, no, we were sinners. We are saints. I hope you understand what I'm saying here because it makes a difference. You see, the lie is to get us to say, I am fundamentally flawed. When the truth is, do you know if you've been saved, you are fundamentally fixed? <laughs> Hallelujah. See, these lies, they cause us to think wrong. They cause us to believe wrong and therefore to act wrong. And so the lies need to be kicked in the, in the teeth and we need to embrace the truth. But you know, some of those lies are kind of hard to kill because, you know, we've used them as our excuses for our failures. But they're lies. And do you know if you don't put those lies to death, it affects you. They need to be put to death. It's like some carpenter bees that I had at uh, my house that I was having uh, uh, trouble with. Oh, my. These carpenter bees are amazing. You know, I'm a city boy, and we got this house out in the country, and, of course, we're not there much much because I travel. But that's the way the Lord led a few years ago. We got it. And, and these carpenter bees were everywhere, and they had power saws and power tools, and they're bur burrowing all these holes into the uh, cedarwood eaves of the house. Well, I got some spray, and I began to spray up there. And, you know, they began to fall out. Now, I didn't know it, but that poison was going to do, do away with them. But... At first, when they fell out, they were still writhing around. I didn't like that. I wanted them dead. <laughs> and so I was standing there with a straw broom that day. And uh, have you ever tried to kill a carpenter bee with a straw broom? It's like trying to squish a rubber peanut. <laughs> it's just not going to work. Well, some of these lies are like those carpenter, be carpenter bees. They're hard to kill. But friends, they must be put to death because if they're not, you will end up playing a cruel joke on yourself. Because if you buy into those lies, I'm a loser, I'm a dud, and so forth and so on, that means when you come to church or your RU meetings, you know, you just put on your mask. <laughs> We've all done it. Uh, pretense, and we pretend to be righteous and doing well, thinking inside, down deep, uh, we're really not only to discover that down deep, God says, you are righteous. You see, as a man thinketh in his heart, not just his mind, his heart, what you latch on to, so is he. You act according to what you believe. And if you ever want your actions to be saintly, you must believe you're a saint. Just as dogs are dogs, that's easy for them. And friends, if you're a saint, if you are a saint, then it's easy for who you are to live saintly. So how does that work? Well, let's finish this up then and get to those last two points. I told you we would just uh, 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 take most of our time on the first point. You see, you've got to come to grips with you're righteous. The real you is righteous. You are not a dud. You are not a failure. You are not this, you know, this blacklisted rebel. No, you are not a dud. When you got saved, the old dud is gone and the new dud's not a dud. He's a dude. <laughs> and the sooner we recognize the power of what's really happening, the power of the new creation, you know what? You'll, you'll be freer from sin, no doubt about it. You'll probably be healthier and you'll finally be free to love. Instead of being all concerned about you, you know, getting cleaned up, you can see beyond yourself and let the love of God flow and bless those around you. So let's move then from the first 
reality, the real you, righteous and holy, to the second reality, the real leader. Now, I love this. The real leader. We've already touched on it. But to remember prior to salvation, in the inner core of your being, your old man, the unregenerated human spirit, was joined to that old master through faith in Jesus. When you got placed into Christ, you got placed into his death, and thus you died to sin. You got severed from, separate from, uh, separated from, unshackled from that old master of indwelling sin. Now, prior to salvation, you were in a relationship that was forced labor. Now you got set free from that old master. You're raised with Christ, the new man. But friends, you get a new master. Because Romans 7, 4 says we're raised so that we might be married, joined to another, even to him who was raised from the dead. You see, the old relationship with indwelling sin has been forever severed, and the new relationship with the indwelling Christ is forever sealed. You see, there's a part of you made holy, so the Holy Spirit can move in. And when you get saved, yes, there's this new creation. God's seed is placed into you. But not only is God's life in you through his nature being implanted into you, his spirit now indwells you. The spirit of the risen Christ, the Christ who won it all at the cross, who rose again, who's exalted to the right hand of the Father. It is the spirit of that enthroned Jesus that moves in and joins your spirit. You got a new leader. But you know, the, the, the new leader doesn't work like the old leader, the old master. The old master is for slavery. The new master doesn't force us. What an amazing thing. In fact, if you so choose, you can go out and choose to serve the old master who's not even your master. But it's no longer forced slavery. Now it's voluntary service. You say, why doesn't the new master just force us? Because we're not robots. And friends, he doesn't want a mechanical ritualism. He wants a love relationship where there's a faith response that chooses him. Why? He's your real leader. And he's your power source. You see, when he moved in, he's there to be your personal guide. The spirit of Jesus to say, this is the way, walk in it. The spirit to make the words of the written word come alive. And He's there that when you trust his power, he enables you to obey his will. You know, when he moved in, what a day that was. You see, your old man died with Christ and was raised the new man. That means the old man is gone forever. You cannot have an unregenerated spirit and a regenerated spirit in the same body. Now, please don't misunderstand. The old master's still hanging around. He tries to deceive us, tries to stumble us. Uh, uh, he hangs around the soul body level. But the real you got radically changed. The old you is gone. The new you is righteous and holy. And that new you is joined to Jesus. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. You're fused to Jesus. And he said, I'll never leave you. You talk about sinless provision. It has to be. His name is Jesus. And he moved in. And the beachhead of your regenerated spirit to lead and empower so that your spirit rules over your soul and body the way God intended that to be. So let's take a moment to contrast Satan's lies about the real leader. Satan's lies about God versus the truth about God. Satan lies and tries to get us to think, God cannot satisfy me as much as this sin. God cannot satisfy me as much as this vice or this addiction or whatever the case may be. Friend, that's a lie. Do you know that only Jesus satisfies? Now, that's not just pious rhetoric. You know this. How about those times when you bought into the deceitfulness of sin, you made the wrong choice, you thought this was going to be great, and you find yourself all bound up? Well, that's not satisfying. But how about those times when you yield to Jesus? And his very life is imparted to you so that your personality is animated by him. You see, the spirit for life is when the spirit fills you with the life of Jesus. And friends, when that happens, you experience his victorious life and you're free from that sin. You're free from the pull. Wow, that's satisfying. Here's another lie. God loves me less when I sin and more when I don't. 
Now, friend, if you think that way, you have a performance-based grid of the Christian life or of sanctification. That God loves you more when you do well and God's mad at you and He loves you less when you sin. That's not true. If you think that way, no wonder you're not accessing your provision. Do you know that God loves you as His child unconditionally? Which means that God loves you as much on your worst day as on your best. Now, friends, let that sink in. That's unconditional love. He actually does love us as much on our worst day as on our best. And friends, I'm going to tell you, when the truth of the love of God actually sinks in, it's life-changing. It really is. Because it doesn't push you away, it draws you to Jesus. Let me give one more lie. Satan tries to get us to think that God's far away. We've made wrong choices, we've stumbled, God's way far away, He's mad at us. He's waiting with a sledgehammer for us to pop our head up so He can <laughs> slam it back down. That's a wrong view of God. And we kind of have this ogre view of God. Maybe when you were a kid, you got called into the principal's office. <laughs> I did. And, you know, uh, let's just picture it this way. Sometimes we view God as that ogre principal. Not, 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 not every principal is an ogre, but some of them are. <laughs> and, uh, and so we view God as this ogre principal. We called into the principal's office and we're standing there trembling. And there sits the principal on the other side of this massive desk looking at us with a glare. And there on the desk is a stacked, I mean, a heap, a, 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 a stack of demerit slips, and our name is on every one. Oh, man. And this is our wrong view of God. And so we think we hear God thinking. <laughs> and we think that God is thinking, ah, oh, there you are again. What a failure. You know, before you were saved, you at least had an excuse. <laughs> Not anymore. We have this ogre view of God, far away. And don't misunderstand me. Obviously, when we choose sin, it separates us from the blessings that we have. But it does not separate us from God because the Bible says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And He said, I'll never leave you. Which means it's a lie to think God's far away. In fact, to use our illustration here, God's not on the other side of that desk even. He's on our side of it. And Jesus stands right there and puts his arm around us. And together we look at that stack, that heaping stack of demerit slips. And he says with very kind tones, you know, that's quite a stack. Don't you ever sleep? <laughs> but he draws us. He woos us to Him because His blood cleanses and His Spirit enables us. You see, we have to have a right view of God. He's not far away. We're joined. We're joined. It's critical to know that. And that one you're joined to is the new leader and He leads perfectly. He's the new coach, we might say. I love to read of uh, accounts where you have these mediocre or lousy ball teams and they get this new coach and he comes in and things are changed and transformed and he takes them right to the championship. I love it. Well, I'm going to tell you, we got the coach. His name is Jesus. And friends, not only does he have a perfect strategy for our life, he's not taken surprise by your setting, your environment, uh, nothing. And he has a perfect strategy. But not only does he have a perfect will for your life, leadership for your life, he gets inside your uniform, as it were, to empower you with His life to do His will. That's amazing. So that brings us to the final reality. We've seen the real you, the new you, righteous and holy. We've seen the real leader, the Holy One of God. The Spirit of Jesus has moved in to lead and to empower. And finally, your real response. Your real response is the response of the real you. God's nature in you, to the real leader, God's spirit in you, 
That's your real response. Satan's lie can be summed up in one big fat lie. I want my sin. That is a lie. You say, well, why does it feel like I want my sin? That's not you. You remember back to the concentric circles, body, soul, spirit, and your old man joined to that old master, you got severed. You died with Christ unto that old master, unto indwelling sin. You're raised with Christ the new man. Now you're joined to Jesus, the new master. Okay, but the old master still hangs around your soul and body level. See, your spirit got completely saved. That's God's nature. It has to be completely saved. Your soul is what is to be being saved. And when you make choices of faith, there's progression. When you don't, there's hindrance. Your body's not saved at all, so stop giving it a chance. So that old master still lives. He resides, as it were, in your soul and body level. But you got disconnected from him. You're joined to Jesus. So when a temptation hits and you feel the pull and it seems like you want that sin, that's not you. That's that old master trying to make you think that you're him and he's you, but he's not you and you're not him. Now, understand something. Temptation is not sin. It's critical for us to understand this. When you get tempted in your mind, in your emotions, you feel the pull. That's not you. And you haven't sinned yet. Do you know that the Bible says that Jesus was tempted? <laughs> and all points like as we yet without sin. So temptation can't be sin. Jesus was tempted. That's why Jesus said, pray ye that ye enter not into temptation. You see, there's a moment to escape. There's time. If you'll take your provision, you might feel that pull. And you might think, well, I don't remember choosing this, but I guess I must have because I feel the pull. No, no, that's the old master. And you have that opportunity to say, that is not me. I reject that. I claim my provision in Jesus. And the moment you do, the moment you take the reality, the moment you take what's fresh and new, this all new reality that you have God's righteous nature in you and you have the spirit of Jesus in you, when you take what is true, I reject it. I claim Jesus. Immediately, that pull evaporates <laughs> and you experience the victorious life of Jesus. See, you take, and now when you act, it's not just you. It's Christ animating you with his freeing, divine, victorious life. You see, the real you. God's nature in you oh, always wants the real leader. God's spirit in you. You know, the real you loves Jesus. The real you adores Jesus. The real you wants Jesus every time. Not the sins, not the junk. The real you wants Jesus. And so it's time to give way to the new realities, to take the truth of what God says is so. See, we live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So to put it simply, there's, there's just two faith steps here. All of these provisions are already there. These are more than promises. Thank God for promises. But they're the will be's and the shall be's, which means they're a little bit out there yet. <laughs> they're potentialities, and they can be obtained through faith, Hebrews eleven thirty three. 33. But these are facts. These are realities right now. You don't have to ask for what already is. If you do, you don't believe it is. <laughs> But you do need to take it. To use the word in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God who is giving us the victory, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if he is giving, then we must be taking. It's Galatians 2, 20. Christ lives, is living in me, dot, 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 by faith. So he's living in us, but you don't benefit if you don't take what God is giving. And so the point is, he is giving us the victory, our Lord Jesus Christ. We simply must take. You see, we have these new realities. The real us wants him every time. Take a hold of that. God, thank you. You see, if somebody handed you a $100 bill and you took it, if you're courteous, you'd say thank you. And that thank you means you believe you have received. Now you can act on it. And in the same way, we can take our provision in Jesus. The only difference is the $100 bill is physical. What we're talking is spiritual. That's the only difference. But it's just as real as if it were physical. And you take the reality of your provision. And now when you act, you have the divine life of God animating you. That's how you can go from being regularly defeated 
Surprised by victory, to being regularly victorious. Surprised by defeat. You see, you've got to change your thinking to what God says is so. Your default mode that many think is my default mode is to sin unless I choose righteousness. No, you are righteous. Your default mode is righteousness unless you choose sin. Oh, wow. When you grab a hold of these new realities, it changes your whole system of belief and you act according to what you believe you are. And so it's time to go past the noise of Satan's lies, past the noise of the world, past the noise even of your soul, down deep to that real response from the real you to the real leader. And you take Jesus in the face of that temptation. I reject that pull. I'm taking Jesus. And friends, when you do, you experience Jesus. Man, hallelujah. And that's how you grow. This is not sin management. This is metamorphosis. This is how you're transformed. And so, one final thought. In the world of nature, God has given us an amazing example of this incredible discrepancy sometimes between who we appear to be versus who we actually are. Consider for a moment the caterpillar. Do you know if we were to take a caterpillar and bring it to a biologist and ask him to analyze it, check its DNA, which is its internal blueprint, he would come back and he would say, you know, I know this looks like a caterpillar. But according to every scientific test, including the DNA, this is fully and completely a butterfly. Wow. God has wired into this creature that does not yet look like a butterfly. A full-blown butterfly identity. And because that caterpillar is, is a butterfly in essence, that's the real caterpillar, then someday it will display the behavior and the attributes of a butterfly. Because some of God's little creatures are a little bit better sometimes about depending on God's provision than some of us. Now, friends, what's really happening is that the caterpillar matures into what is already true about it. Now, in that maturity process, it's not going to help to berate it. It's not going to help for us to come to the caterpillar and say, hey, you know, Mr. Scientist over here just said, uh, uh, you're, uh, you're a butterfly. Man, you don't look like a butterfly. Wow, you must be a loser. You're one of those duds. <laughs> I know what it is. You're a rebel. <laughs> hey, you ought to at least fake it. Velcro on these wings. And that's how some people attempt the Christian life. No, 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 no. You access Jesus. And friends, when you take by faith the provision of His life in you, His nature implanted, and especially His Spirit indwelling. You take His life to obey His will. That's when you mature into what you already are. So let's take the all-new realities so that when we act, we experience the victorious life of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for truth. We thank you that truth sets free. And we thank you that truth is personified in Jesus Christ. May we take your provision that we might experience the very life of Jesus. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.